everyone. Um, I'm Sukant Bose from the LIGO India team at Ayuka, and our guest today is uh, Professor Luciano Rezzola uh, from University of Frankfurt. He's actually a director of an institute there, but uh, it's better to hear about the details of his occupation directly from uh, Luciano than from me. So let's get started. Okay. So, so yeah, tell us a bit about yourself. So my name is Luciano Rezzola. Uh, I am um, the chair of theoretical astrophysics in Frankfurt and I'm also the director of the Institute for Theoretical Physics there. I'm Italian, um, but um, I work in Germany since about 10 years. I was before in at the Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics in Potsdam, and then uh, in 2013, I moved over to Frankfurt. I see myself as a um, relativistic astrophysicist. I therefore study objects like black holes and neutron stars, which are the most relativistic objects we can think of, and try to match the uh, predictions that come from theory uh, to the actual observation that come in terms of gravitational waves or other forms of uh, electromagnetic radiation. I am particularly, um, you know, the tools I normally use for my work, daily work, are numerical codes. And these are essentially, you know, where all of our joys and pains come from because these are the results of um, decade-long developments, uh, the hard work of many students and postdocs, and um, are then what allows us to go deep into the um, dynamics of these objects and allow us to make predictions about what happens, for instance, where two neutron stars merge and what type of signal they produce in terms of gravitational radiation, but also in terms of electromagnetic radiation. Very nice. So yes, uh, you um, led to the development of a very important uh, code base in numerical relativity for quite some years, and uh, we are benefiting from the results that are being produced by that enterprise. Um, of course, in LIGO India, uh, we are doing a broad set of things. Um, um, majority of that effort is experimental, but we look at uh, benefiting in the you know science and observational aspects from that instrument. Um, now, from your experience, and uh, you know, if, could you tell us about uh, the the code that you led the development of, um, and um, what kind of uh, things you learned in the process, and um, what do you expect, or what are the couple of you know research findings from that effort that uh, are very close to your heart, that are very important to science today? So, I have started developing. Um parallel 3D codes for the solution of the Ansins equations and those of relativistic dynamics about 15 years ago. And I like to think of this effort as, at any time I have three codes. I have one code which I use to do science. I have one code that I am developing and I'm not using for doing science. And then I have a code that I dream of. And it is my, what the kind of code I would like to develop in the future. So um, the codes we uh, we are using nowadays are allow us to study essentially the dynamics of two bodies of two compact objects, be it neutron stars or black holes or mixed binaries of this type. And developing these codes um, is particularly um, complex because it requires a number of expertise. You see, the problem with the Ansins equations is that exact solutions are very rare and, and, and the rarity is normally refined to confine to having symmetries in, this, in the problem. So if you have spherical symmetry and staticity, um, then you have a number of killing vectors that you can exploit and then you can formulate a solution rather simply, either analytically like the Schwarzschild solution for vacuums uh, or a non-rotating star, in which case, you know, it's not analytic, but it's still the result of um, an ordinary differential equation. As soon as you move away from these very simple symmetries, then you have to employ the full set of equations of Ansen's equations. And there comes the first problem, because Ansen's equations are formulated in a covariant form, that is in a form which is independent of coordinates. And, and so not only you have to find a solution to these equations, you also have to find the set of coordinates where this solution can be found. And, um, and, and this requires a lot of, of work before you can even start coding your equations. So you have to find a mathematical formulation which is best suited for 
um, solving a given problem. And this is something that people have looked at back in the 60s, where the first formulations of the answers equation for numerical solutions were proposed. They are called the ADM equations from uh, Arnowit, Deiser, and Misner. And this looked like very reasonable, mathematically well-founded formulations. Allah, when you, people try to solve those equations, realize that actually then they were not suitable. They were written in a form that uh, resulted to be weakly hyper hyperbolic. And this is a form which is not sufficient to guarant guarantee stability. In the 90s, people then realized there was this problem and moved away from this formulation and, and looked at, at a new formulation, which is the, the what is called the BSSN NARC formulation. And this is a formulation that is widely used. Um, but nowadays we use a different formulation, which is yet an evolution from that one, and it's called the CCZ4. Um, this may be a bit too technical, but let's say that there is still a lot of development in how you actually write your Einstein's equation, because writing the equations in the right way is essential for them to be to lead to a, a stable solution. So once you have decided that, that your formulation is correct, then you have to com convert this formulation into a numerical code. And there are different numerical techniques in order to solve the same set of equations. And there are very simple techniques like finite difference, which is the way th the first codes were developed, and more sophisticated techniques like spectral methods or discontinuous Galerkin methods, which are the ones that we are actually developing at the moment and uh, promise to be the best way of, of solving these equations. So when you look at it in this way, numerical relativity is a technically squared branch of science because not only you need to have large expertise in mathematics in order to go from Einstein's equations to the proper formulation, you also need them to have uh, expertise in computational methods in order for solving these equations. And this is why it is a process that takes um, a large group, a large manpower, a coordinated effort. This is not very different from an experimental effort. Also in that case, you know, the, the, there are many aspects that need to be covered and, and, and tamed at the same time so that you have something that works. In the case of an experiment, you want an experiment that gives data below a certain noise. Um, in the case of a code, you want you know, a code that solves the equations at a given accuracy so that you can extract some useful information. Yeah, so this, those are important challenges, which of course you battled and you solved and in a very timely manner, in the sense that by the time the LIGO detectors in the US and the Virgo detector in Europe uh, were read, you know, they started taking data and then made these discoveries. Um, uh, culminating with uh, the binary neutron star merger uh, detection about a year and you know five months ago, almost to the date, um, uh, you were prepared right. with your code so that you could actually interpret the signals and uh, um, explain the physics and maybe also make some new predictions. So uh, that I think tells to us it is very important to be on time. And I guess that's an important lesson also for new experiments and new detectors coming up that uh, the you know, next round of discoveries uh, should be made hopefully with them participating and contributing to them. Um, so um, uh, looking a bit now to the future, uh, what uh, are your expectations of you know, things uh, that may happen uh, from the observational side and how your efforts may contribute to examine and unravel new physics uh, through those observations. Right, so you, you, you are absolutely right. Um, as a theorist, you have to, to you know, play in advance and, and, and make sure that you know the answer to the problem before the problem will actually manifest itself. Otherwise, you cannot make a prediction. Um, in the case of binary neutron stars and also binary black holes, we were lucky in that we were able to have a prediction, for instance, in terms of gravitational waveforms, um, and these predictions were matched then by the observation so much so that, you know, numerical relativity uh, waveforms were used for building templates. In the case of binary neutron stars, um, there are still a number of unsolved issues that um, will become even more severe as new detection will be made. And, and I can name a few. The first one is, there is evidence now, because we've seen it, that binary neutron star mergers and gamma ray bursts are associated. 
And there is a very rough phenomenological explanation of gamma ray bursts in terms of having a black hole launching a jet which uh, is powered by ultra-relativistic flows. But how do you actually do this? How does, how does the fusion of two stars lead to an, an ultra-relativistic jet? This is a problem that has not been solved yet and might take you know, a few, maybe a decade to be solved or maybe even more. The reason is that um, there are a number of physical processes that go into this that are hard, very hard to describe and that touch the, the, our ability to describe this, this process. What we know now is that if you take two stars and they are, don't have any magnetic field, then none of the phenomenology that we expect um, from the gamma ray burst picture is present. The two stars fuse, they produce a black hole, there is an accretion disk, but that's it. There is no electromagnetic emission that, that can be associated to a gamma ray burst. On the other hand, if you put in a magnetic field, then the story seems to change. And the system seems to lead after some uh, time, after the black hole formation, to a, a structure which is a jet. It looks like a jet is not a jet in the sense that there is an outflow, but the magnetic field does have a structure that is mostly poloidal, so something like a funnel. And, but the matter in this funnel is not moving. It actually, it's not moving outwards, it's, it's just falling onto the black hole. And that is, you can think in terms of plasma physics, this is like a pipe. There is a pipe and there is some fluid in this pipe, but this fluid is too cold. So the only thing that can do is just fall onto the black hole because it has very little angular momentum near the pole. And so what you want to do is, just like in a pipe, you want to heat up the fluid so that the fluid can actually escape. And heating up the fluid requires a number of physical effects which are very hard to control. One of them is energy and momentum transfer from neutrinos. You can think that there is this accretion disk which is very hot and is irradiating the funnel and providing some energy which again heats up this pipe just like producing vapor in, in, in a pipe in a steam engine. Other mechanisms could be invoked like for instance reconnection. Uh, magnetic fields that twist and uh, reconnect, they dissipate energy, and this energy locally can provide um, the input for this acceleration. So modeling this is very hard, it requires advanced methods and, you know, maybe the development of my dream code uh, in, in the future. But um, so this is one of the open issues. And um, I think any, any young scientist and brilliant mind should feel like, okay, this is what I should really discover and, 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 and explain. Another problem that, that we, it's difficult to describe right now is that we know there is this association, we know there is some matter which is expelled, and this matter then goes into a nucleosynthesis producing heavy elements. But measuring this mass in an accurate manner is very difficult because there are a number of mechanisms that produce this ejection, and this ejection is just a few percent of the mass budget of the system. So you want to be able at the same time to, you know, model the 99% of the matter that is in the system and the 1% that is very precious because this is not only the one that we see in, the, in terms of afterglows and electromagnetic uh, kilonova emission, but it's also important because it leads to the nucleosynthesis and the heavy elements. Again, this is one of those model, one of those problems that is very hard from numerical simulation to tackle accurately. And, uh, you know, another um, problem that, that awaits solution from, from brilliant minds. Uh, you actually started addressing uh, my next question, which is uh, what uh, types of problems um, this um, incoming group of students and postdocs can look forward to, to work on related to uh, our um, areas of interest. Um, so it seems like, yes, if you're uh, talking about binary neutron stars, yes, we have in some ad hoc ways tried to understand, you know, the jet structure uh, and also the, you know, unbound ejecta that could be fodder for heavy elements, heavy metals. Um, um, and um, 
Do you have any remaining words of advice for these young minds as to um, maybe, you know, not necessarily limited to just numerical relativity, which is um, at the core of your interest, but other related areas that uh, uh, detectors for LIGO or India uh, would cater to? Uh, what kind of, so is there enough opportunity for these young minds to remain busy with and be motivated by for the next 10 years or yeah, so? Yeah, so I think, you know, if, if the, the um Working in, in an advanced experiment like LIGO India provides uh, young people, students with perfect opportunities to be addressing difficult problems, uh, which no one has, has looked at before. And this is, you know, essential to develop the attitude um, that then would allow them to solve any problem and therefore become not only good scientists and, in, and, and within an academic uh, context, but also be the type of minds that a private company would would like to hire because these are problem solvers. They can these are, you know, at the end of the day, what we have is a complex problem, and we teach our students how to break it into simple parts, uh, be able to see the global picture, and at the same time resolve a very specific problem. And these are properties, you know, that uh, once you learn them, that you can use them for any problem be it uh, building an experiment or a code or, you know, working on a, in a company that does technology. So um, it's a generic uh, skill set that, 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 that these people would learn by, by, by being close to these type of uh, projects. I think you made a very important point, which is basically about the broader impact of these large scale projects. It's true that these projects are taken a very important you know, investment from the government and the taxpayer. And in turn, what they can do is you know, produce many uh, a workforce, um, a part of which will contribute to the experiment directly, but uh, there are others who will get trained but may go on to develop the nation because they have these transferable skills, you know, those of problem solvers. So um, uh, I, I cannot emphasize the importance yeah. of the statement enough. Um, uh, and, and if you think about it from, from you know, nowadays, all of our technology um, either comes from people who have entrepreneurs that have been trained by academicians or academicians themselves. So it's quite clear that the source of technology at the lowest level is fundamental research. So by the time you fund fundamental research, you're going to have an impact uh, on down the road in terms of technology. Excellent. Um, my last question is, um, do you have any words for the LIGO India project per se? Um, you know, it could be anything, uh, but like um, there are ways in which maybe your research will benefit from uh, more uh, LIGO-like detectors across the world or maybe what those detectors can gain from the type of research you're doing? Yes, so um, certainly um, I, I, I will gain from um, having a, a, an India detector, an Indian detector, in that my, um, you know, the characterization and localization of the sources I'm most interested in, binary neutron star, will be much more precise having um, a new detector in India. This will enormously impact our ability to understand what are the progenitor of these, ob of, of these objects, what are the, the phenomenology that we should expect, what is intrinsic to the source and what is instead uh, the result of the interaction of the source with the, with the environment. So knowing where they are exactly or much more accurately than otherwise is a very important contribution that, that LIGO India can, can provide to my, to my work. Um, on the other hand, I think um, my work can, can help maybe concentrate the, the LIGO India on those parts of the sensitivity spectrum where m a lot of the information is there and might be used if uh, the detector is properly designed. In particular, if we look at the properties of the gravitational wave signal from binary neutron star, this is at a very high frequency where detectors tend to be not very sensitive. And uh, it would be useful to improve sensitivity there. And of course, you know, you want to know exactly where you would like to improve it and how, how much. And this is a kind of answer that um, 
my work can give because I, I am by modeling the signal in those regions of the spectrum, I can tell more precisely whether you should have high sensitivity at two kilohertz or rather three or five or, or, and, and not bother maybe at seven. So is this it's synergy between theory and experiment that, that can benefit both, I think. So your research has impacted you know, gravitational wave observations, um, but in fact, um, people who know um, the implications of your work uh, also realize that uh, it has wider um, um, repercussions um, in other aspects of multi-messenger astronomy. So would you like to share a little bit about uh, what are these different ways in which other areas of physics are benefiting? Right. So. Um, multi-messenger um, astronomy. W what is that? Uh, I I'm often asked this question and, um, you know, the standard answer is that we see an astronomical object provide a signal in two different channels. And, you know, half of the people understand the answer and half people don't understand this answer. So I normally provide a, a, a pragmatic example that I hope gets also the other 50%. Imagine you have a firework. Okay, you're looking at a firework at a certain distance from it. What you will see is first the firework itself. You will see the light, okay? Uh, the different colors, the different shapes. And then because you are a certain distance, after a certain amount of time, you will see also, you will receive the sound, okay? Well, this is the same object which is providing you two messages or uh, it's a multi-message phenomenon because you see both the light and at the same time, you see, you hear the sound, which is a, just a sound wave propagating from near the explosion over to your ear. So it's two different channels over which information propagates. Now, in the case of astronomy, there isn't a sound because there is vacuum between us and the source, but there is another channel besides lights that can reach us. And this is the gravitational wave. And so um, a multi-messenger astronomy is this ability to get to look at the same object in two different ways and learn complementary things. Just like in a firework, you know, looking just at the color is not enough because a bright color might have a low sound and, and vice versa. So it's very important to have both of this information. And the beauty of, of multi-messenger astronomy is that um, allows you to obtain information not only on the gravitational field of, of, of the source, but also on the state of the matter that produces just uh, by looking at, again, at a firework and looking at the color, you can understand what is the composition of uh, the chemical that exploded. But by listening also to the sound, you understand how much of that explosive was there because you can relate that, that other information. And now in the case of uh, compact sources of, of gravitational waves like neutron stars and black holes, um, you can learn something about what neutron stars are made of. And that's not a simple question. In fact, nuclear physicists would love to know the answer to this question. Um, this is normally formulated in terms of equations of state. So we would like to know with precision what is inside a neutron star. What we know roughly is that there are one, two solar masses, and they are confined between 10 and, 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 and 13 kilometers. But what is the composition? Um, is there quark matter inside this? So all of a sudden, an astronomical observation and a gravitational observation has an impact on a transversal field of physics, nuclear physics. And this is the beauty of multi-messenger astronomy that um, by having different messengers allows you then to impact not only on astronomy per se, you know, knowing where is this source in which galaxy, but also explain what happens to uh, 1.5 solar masses of matter and you confine it into 12 kilometers. This is something laboratories cannot explain, but this rising branch of science can. And so it is very exciting to be able to do this type of research. And in addition, you know, opens up um, avenues to explore physics that cannot be explored in laboratory. Quark matter, for instance, can you produce quarks? We think quarks were produced early on in the universe. And then, you know, although we made of quarks, they are not free, they are confined. Um, uh, fortunately for us. But when you have two neutron stars and they merge, can you then reproduce conditions which are similar to the early universe? 
And again, with our theoretical models, we can predict whether or not this happens and under what conditions. So, yeah. Right, so yeah, that's another important point. So very large objects um, that we are viewing with these detectors or telescopes can tell us something about some very tiny interactions Indeed. or interactions, you know, among very tiny particles like constituents of nucleons, basically quarks, um, and eventually tell us, you know, how dense matter can be Indeed. before it has to yes. collapse. So, so um, that's mind boggling. I'm sure <laughs> that will interest many, many um, uh, of our junior colleagues uh, about this area of uh, um, uh, seeking knowledge, science. Um, a different type of question. You have had experience in, um, you know, transcending cultures going from one part of the world to a very different part of the world and culture, and then contributing to you know building a collaboration, building a group. Um, uh, in LIGO India, we are going through a similar exercise. So can you share with us uh, uh, some of that uh, part of your life where you know you learned something in the process of building a collaboration, you contributed ways, you know, what kind of problems did you have to deal with and how exciting it was to contribute to the solutions? Mm -hmm. Well, so, um in, in, in modern science, uh, inevitably, because the problems are so difficult um, and challenging that requires, you know, the construction of very complex experiments or very complicated codes, um, this inevitably requires, uh, at the same time, the ability of um, exciting people of doing together a job uh, well done. And so um, inspiring people, managing them, um, is part of the skills that are required uh, um, nowadays at the, at, the, at, the, at the scientific levels that we carry out these experiments. And in addition to this, one, in addition to management skills, you also need um, the ability to accept different and cultural differences and yet at the same time harmonize them so that everybody um, can work together. And this is something that um, in Europe we have learned to do um, through networks involving different European countries. And, um, you know, the, the strongest friendships have, have, have been sealed in this way uh, among people from very different countries. And this is another message for, for the young people. Um, working in these uh, environments allow us scientists not only to study something interesting, but also normally to meet interesting people with very different cultural background who live in very different countries and to visit them and so to learn about this. So it is a, a small but important benefit of working in, in international collaborations. Well, thank you very much, Professor Rezula, for spending your, your valuable time with us uh, today. Um, and congratulations for uh, the important findings you have made, which are helping us understand these most energetic events uh, in the form of compact object mergers in the universe that LIGO and Virgo are detecting, and also for providing inputs into how we should design you know, future detectors to be able to tap into new physics. Okay. So good luck for your future yeah, endeavors. Thank you for having me.